This is Film Talk, where we interview the brightest minds in filmmaking five days a week. Do you need a great camera for your next shoot? You may want to consider the world's lightest handheld Super 35 digital film camera, Blackmagic's Ursa Mini 4.6K. The Ursa Mini boasts a 4.6K sensor, global shutter, and up to 15 stops of dynamic range. It's perfectly balanced for handheld use and comfortable enough to be used all day long. Scene one, take one. Film Talk Nation, we are greenlit for yet another great show. Vanessa Frank here, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today, Dr. Linda Sager. Dr. Sager, are you ready for your close-up? You bet. <laughs> Dr. Linda Sager created the script consulting profession in 1981 and is one of the world's foremost script consultants. She is also the most prolific author on the subject of screenwriting with nine books on the subject and is known worldwide as one of the industry's utmost experts in the field of screenwriting. Dr. Sager has consulted on over 100 produced feature films, television shows and plays and her clients have won numerous awards including Academy Awards, awards from numerous film festivals, as well as achieving box office hits. She has lectured on screenwriting in 33 countries on all six continents, and she has trained over 75 script consultants on her method internationally. Dr. Sager's clients include writers, directors, producers, executives, and companies in film, television, and theater. They range from beginners to Academy Award winners such as Peter Jackson and William Kelly. Dr. Sager is the recipient recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Redemptive Film Festival for her 30 plus years of work as a script consultant. She is a recipient of the Candlelight Award for being a light to the entertainment industry, the Distinguished Alumni Award from Pacific School of Religion, and the Moondance, Moondance Film Festival Living Legacy Award for her support of women in the film industry. Dr. Sager, it is an honor to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. I'm so happy you asked me. So, Dr. Sega, you have had, obviously, an illustrious career. Um, without a doubt, you are one of the foremost experts when it comes to uh, screenwriting analysis and um, and just, uh, you know, overall a, a, a lifetime's body of work in, in the area of, of um, story. Um, how did you first get into the industry? Because, you know, from what I understand, when you started out in, in your profession, there really wasn't anyone doing what you were doing. No, this job did not exist. What happened was I had been a college professor and the most recent job had cutbacks. And so suddenly I was on the outskirts of Los Angeles without a job. And it made sense to me that with my background in drama, that the film industry would be waiting for me with open arms, but they were not. They couldn't have cared less. And in fact, because I had such an education in drama, they did not want to hire me. I was in my 30s. But the other thing is that Hollywood, especially then, had a tendency to be anti-education. The idea was that if you were too educated, you were not practical, and they needed practical people. So when I realized that was a problem, I took all my degrees off my resume except for my BA in English. So I had two other uh, masters at that time and a doctorate. Um, and I thought there's no way I'll get a job with that resume. So I started by working at Norman Lear's company as a one-day replacement. For um, I actually was the assistant to the assistant of the director of development, and it turned into two days and it turned into some months. And during that time, there was a writer who had a script that he brought to my boss, and he said, boy, I've been struggling. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. And I suggested that I take my doctoral dissertation method, which was trying to understand what makes a great script, and use it to see what was missing in his script. And I pinpointed it, and he said, I've spent five years trying to figure this out, and in one hour I know exactly what to do. So I began to feel maybe I had something here, and I um, I didn't know what to call myself, and my hairdresser helped me figure out I was a script consultant because I consulted on scripts, and 
I put an ad in the Hollywood Reporter and got my first client and then started to get some. It was very, very difficult. And about a almost two years into this little part-time job, I met a career consultant. And we decided, um, I decided to work with her, and she was really my breakthrough. Finding somebody who could figure out how to take this little tiny job that depended on my $18.50 ad every week in The Hollywood Reporter and figure out how I could make a living at it. And she was brilliant. Her name's Judith Clare, and she is in Santa Monica. So she was my breakthrough. Wow, that is just an amazing story. So I'm really curious about this this thesis that was kind of the genesis of this journey for you. Out of just my own sheer interest, where what was that thesis based in? Was this based in kind of you know like classical literature? I mean, wh- what yeah. was the what was the crux of the thesis? Well, well, here's what we were allowed to do for this program. We could do a project, and I directed the play The Visit by Friedrich Dernmont. It was a very rich, very thematic play. And I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of different papers on it. So it wasn't like writing a book. It was writing a lot of long papers analyzing this play. And I looked at what is the structure? This was a play in three acts. And what was going on at the beginning? What was going on in the middle? And I began to look at the elements of character and conflict and the, the structure and the movement and began to see these three acts, um, looked at the theme, looked at the ideas. And I began to see that a great script has all of this going on and has a certain structure. So when I applied that for my own work, I said, well, what's missing? Oh, conflict is missing in this script. Or, oh, there's not a clear theme or idea. There's the beginning of one. We need to bring it out. Or the structure is off. Or the characters are not dimensional and they're not really moving the story. And, of course, as I've worked on, I've worked on over 2,000 scripts now, and when you work on 2,000 scripts, you learn a lot because you see problems you've never heard of before at times, and then you have to figure out how to fix them given the writer's subject matter and the kind of story they're working on. So if they're doing an action adventure, I'm not going to turn it into comedy or I'm not going to say, well, maybe you know, <laughs> we change everything. They're not ghosts. They're demons instead or something. I don't, co- I don't do those kind of ideas. My job is to help make whatever the person sent me work the best it can work given what they sent me. So obviously there's some ideas and stories that are better than others, but I'm there to to help them. I would imagine that with having analyzed over 2,000 scripts, you must see frequent patterns um, yeah. in terms of uh, weaknesses or strengths, what is what would you say is, is kind of the most common flaw that you see in scripts? Well, when I first started out, the biggest flaw was structure. There was not a sense of the story. There was not a clear sense of a beginning, middle, and end and a narrative track. But what has happened now is that... Um, More and more people take seminars, they read books, they become knowledgeable so that even a person's first script is probably in better shape now than it was in the 1980s when there were fewer seminars to take, fewer books, etc. I would say now is originality and really developing and exploring an idea and a story, not just throwing action at something, but really keeping it going and keeping it focused. So I get a lot of scripts where focus is the major problem. Uh, it, they, you know, writers take detours or they throw in things that don't help advance the story. So my job is to help them figure out what is it um, you're trying to focus on. And um, you obviously... Um 
you know, with with having seen so, you know, you've you've worked with an incredibly long list of talent over the years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you you know, you still you continue to work with beginners. You know, in between consulting some of the biggest names in the industry, um, do you? Are you of the belief that writers get to a point where they are autonomous enough to where they don't need that second pair of eyes, they don't need, you know, a consultant, an analyst, or do you kind of think that um, we all we all need a second opinion? Well, writers have trouble being objective, as anybody does, and so uh, they they might not need it through multiple drafts or. They might say, I feel confident about this script, but not this script. But I get a lot of writers who are very, very experienced, and I can see their struggle because the better the writer, a lot of times the more they're attempting to do something that's very challenging, and then they get lost in the forest. So I tend to think it's a good idea for anybody. And, um, I mean, when I write... I, I wouldn't have a book published, and I, I have 13 books out, nine on screenwriting. I would not dream of even taking a book to my publisher and, and you know handing it in without having had at least six or eight people read it and give me feedback. So I just think you always need it. And, and the per, if you go to a professional, and I mean, you have to be a little careful. You don't want someone who demoralizes you or takes your script in some new direction that you don't want to go. But chances are you're always going to get something of value from that other pair of eyes. They're simply going to see something that you don't see and, um, you know, be of help. And sometimes people go to their friends who might be fellow writers and might be really good, and that can many times be workable. Uh, what I have on my books, I have a group of readers. They're not professional readers. They're just giving me feedback. And if they get stuck and I get stuck, I have a professional consultant I hire. And sometimes I only hire him for a few pages. I might say, you know, I don't think my first page is good. And we, I just, I've talked with my other readers and we don't really know exactly what to do. I did that on one book, and he says, ah, he says, your first paragraph goes on your next page. He says, start with your third paragraph, which is second paragraph after the third one. Do a transition sentence, and this is going to work. And it did. So, you know, so you often need that person who is more of a professional, and sometimes you say, you know what, I went to my friend who's a really good writer, and I think this is ready to go out. I think it's in good shape. Um. Dr. Sega, obviously you yourself are an accomplished writer, as you mentioned, you have had 13 books published um, and you have really um, mentored uh, now a couple of generations of, of writers. Um, I would imagine that you probably of have some very strong some fairly strong beliefs on you know the kind of that some daily practices that writers or creatives can be uh doing as a means of of really continuing to hone their craft what are those daily practices that you would recommend well um one of the things you you really need to be constantly learning that means whether that means seminars or whether that means reading books or whether that means going to movies and analyzing. And if you see a really great movie, go to it a second time and really look at what they're doing because you're constantly being a sponge of that. But the other thing about daily practices, uh, I think is that people need quiet. They need a quiet time. And it's interesting to me how many you know, whether it's people like me or whether it's writers, say, I just, I take some time, whether it means meditating, praying, centering, saying, I got to get out of the whirlwind. I um, Sometimes I call this the creative breath. It's like that, you know, breathing in and say, I just have to kind of be there in a quiet place before I write because the worst thing for writing is being frenetic one of the worst things. There's many bad things for writing. But, you know, being to, being frenetic and being 
constantly in motion and say, I just got to get to that blank page and I got to write. Now, it is true if the flow is there, you want to be writing. And whether that's at 2 a.m. or 7 a.m. or whatever time that is, you do need to be writing. But I think that it's very important for writers to say, I have to do this with some sense of quiet and some sense of center and some sense of depth because you've got to reach really deep as a writer. And I know even in the books that I write, um, after I you know, I finish the book or be almost finish I, and go back, sometimes I say, you know, it's not deep enough. It's not original enough. This chapter isn't singing yet. And what is it? Oh, I'm, I'm scratching the surface. I'm not getting underneath. I'm not saying anything new. I'm not um, getting into something that's maybe more profound. So let me sit here for a bit in quiet and see what begins to surface or let me sleep on it and not be in too much of a rush to get up in the morning. Let me just lie here in bed and let the ideas flow. So there's a certain kind of a flow that is fluid and harmonious and actually rather peaceful. And I tend to think that's quite important. That's beautiful. Um, Dr. Sega, obviously, with, with having seen so many scripts over the years, do you feel that there's maybe one common trait that you can point to that it's kind of like, if you get this element right, you're already going to be ahead of the curve, you're already, already going to be ahead of the competition. Is there is there a, a simple commonality that you can point to, other than obviously I, just good writing? Well, I think you just, you need to be focused. You need to know what it is you're exploring and what interests you and to stay on track and don't go all over the place. I mean, if I had to just say one thing, because yeah. focus is about structure. It's about clarity. It's about not having excess. It's being, you know, simple enough that you are on that fine line and you are you have a clear path that you are following. We sometimes call that the narrative track. Absolutely. Um Obviously, right now, there's a tremendous number of movies that are being adapted from pre-existing material, um, a real proliferation of adaptations, um, be it from graphic novels or YA books. Um, w do you feel that the approach in adapting um, a, a script from pre-existing material is very different from writing original material, or, or is, in, in your opinion, is it much the same? Um, I think it's different because you've got that boundary that you have to deal with, and then you have to decide to what extent do I have to stay real close to the original material, and what if the original material is not essentially dramatic, how much leeway do I have to adapt? And the more historical it is, the more you have to be very close. So... Um, I will say this year, I'm, I'm pretty sure Bridge of Spies is an adaptation, right? I mean, it's, it's based on a true story. And I can't remember if it came from a book or just from a true story, but I think it's from a book. Bridge of Sp Spies this year, I just think, is a magnificent script. I've watched it twice. I think it's one of the smartest scripts I've ever seen. It has a very sure, confident hand behind it. And then, of course, Spielberg's directing. I think Spielberg's directing is just almost breathtaking. It is so beautifully paced. And he takes his time to let things sink in, but he keeps it moving. So, you know, starts with the script, and then you hope you have a great director to do it. Obviously, you've, you've worked with Peter Jackson, um, amongst other clients that are very well known for their adaptation work of beloved source material. Have you kind of walked through that process with writers of figuring out how do we, you, you know, there's obviously a very passionate fan base to this source material. How do we make sure that we please the audience while obviously making sure that the movie is is succinct enough to, you know, to, to not be like five hours long? Um, how, yeah, yeah. how does one work, <laughs> walk through that process of making sure that the heart of the material that resonates with that fan base is there and yet in a format that is film-friendly. 
Well, when I work on an amputation, the first thing I do is I go through the book and I actually write out what's the action. What is it that people are doing? And then I look at, well, what's the, is there a structure? What's the structure of the story? Now, maybe the first turning point is on page 120 in the book. And so I say, well, we've got to get, we've got to tighten this. What can we lose? That's part of those pages to really get this set up. And of course, it sometimes it's very difficult for writers to adapt their own material because they have to be thinking dramatically rather than literary. Uh, I worked some years ago on Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which was a huge, huge um, best-selling book. And I worked with the writer. When he came to work with me, the first thing I said is, um, you have to really cut the first 100 pages because it's all context, and I think you can get it under the credits. Oh my gosh. And, you know, he left and just decided he did not want to be the writer. So I didn't work with the writer who eventually did that. um, uh, Who eventually did that. Am I right in thinking that was a Clint Eastwood movie? Yes, yes. He actually actually directed directed that. But it was um, one of the things you think totally different, and the writer realized he would have to approach this material and he says I've got a I have a whole new learning curve I have to do do I really want to go back and spend all that time learning to write a script and start cutting and refocusing and doing things differently you know etc so um, it is it's it's quite a process and some books are better adapted than others the um, second I hard movie was based on a book called 58 minutes and one of the things I heard once in a lecture about adaptation, this uh, guy said, you know, sometimes the best books to adapt are the beef books, not the great books. Because the great books are so complex and thematic and sometimes not as much action. But go and look at some of the not-so-good books because they'll have a lot of action and allow you to have the bones that you need for drama, which is action, not just thinking. That's very interesting. Um, Dr. Sigurd, do you feel that when executives are looking at source material, maybe choosing what they're going to option, which obviously, d- depending on the material, can be a pretty expensive process, would you recommend that they engage someone like yourself to, um, you know, to, to analyze the um, validity of that material for adaptation? Yes, and once in a while I have producers say, we don't know whether to spend the money on this. And so they'll bring me in and say, would you read the book or read the article or whatever it is, there or the play? Tell us the difficulties we're going to run into and tell us whether it's feasible. And there's some material who say, you know, it's just going to be really, really tough to adapt this because it's too thematic or... You know, it doesn't have enough movement in it. Now, other things to adapt that somebody might say, well, you can't adapt it. Let's take Driving Miss Daisy. But if you look at the play, there are very specific action points that are going on in this relationship. And you've got this beautiful transformational arc to work with and, of course, great characters. So sometimes a a play or a book that doesn't look adaptable actually might be. That's and very sometimes interesting. sometimes you have to make changes. <laughs> sometimes you have to make a lot of changes to make it work. I would, I would imagine your job must be quite difficult at times, kind of having to, to be the messenger and kind of say to people, well, listen, this, you know, this source material that you've just spent X amount of time on is, or money on is, is actually not a good match for adaptation. Well, I, I will... Uh, show them the challenges and the problems. Now, if they hire me before they option the project, then I will help them assess whether or not this is a good project to do. And if I know the client and know their work, sometimes I can say, I'm not so sure this is the best next step for you, either because it's incredibly difficult and complex or it changes the the writer's brand. So if they're known for action adventure and they want to adapt a comedy, I might 
question that and to say, is this really where you want to go in your career? Because anytime you change from one genre to another, you've got a problem. You've just broken your brand. So, but if they have come to me and say, we have option this, then my job is to figure out how to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell them don't do this or get out of it. I'm, you know, and sometimes they might say, you know what, it's just so complicated. I think we're going to just let the option lapse. And if they haven't spent too much money, maybe that's fine. Yeah. So, yeah. But well, the sooner they assess, the better. And that, that's a very good thing is to say, let's figure this out before we spend the money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Dr. Sager, we're about to enter our final act in which we're going to be getting some of your top recommendations. But before we do so, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. When you're putting together that masterpiece movie, the coloring is a major creative decision. It can make the difference between whether the audience interprets your story as warm, cold, dark, or light, and it can help define the genre of the film. Here's a quick tip. Horror movies tend to have blue tones. Romantic comedies tend to have warm tones. Apocalyptic movies tend to be gray and washed out. Movies in which reality is off kilter tend to have green tones. And action movies tend to feature a lot of teal and orange, particularly in their artwork. The Emmy Award winning Da Vinci Resolve from Black Magic will help you get that perfect color for your next production. The Da Vinci Resolve 12 combines professional non-linear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So you can now edit, color correct, finish and deliver all from one system. The DaVinci Resolve is completely scalable and resolution independent, so it can be used on set, in a small studio, or integrated into the largest Hollywood production pipeline. From creative editing and multi-camera television production to high-end finishing and color correction, only DaVinci Resolve features the creative tools, compatibility, speed, and legendary image quality that you need to manage your entire workflow, which is why it is the number one solution used on Hollywood feature films. Dr. Sega, welcome to the final act where you'll be sharing some incredible resources and mind-blowing answers. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Sega, what is the best advice you've ever received? I think from my mother. And in fact, I wrote a little book about it. It's called What Our Mamas Taught Us. And it came out last February. And my mother, I said, invest in experiences. And she used to say, you know, invest in experiences, not stocks and bonds. And she said, if you have an opportunity to do an experience and have an opportunity for anything that's going to be interesting and fun and all that, do it. Um, and I follow that in my work and in my life. The one thing is I don't do things that are dangerous. So I um, do check things, you know, sometimes I'm invited to uh, unique countries. <laughs> I said, oh, my mother would say that sounds really exciting, but it's dangerous. Yes. <laughs> so I said, oh, yeah. Okay. So I'd say that was great advice. It's indeed, that's actually one of the, uh, my favorite pieces of advice, uh, of advice that I've ever been given is, you know, don't, don't spend your money on things, spend your money on experiences. They'll last yes. a lot longer. Um, yes. So, Dr. Sega, obviously, you, you've seen so many projects come and go and, and likely so many careers come and go. If you had only one movie to stake your entire career on, what kind of movie would it be and what talent would you want attached? Well, I don't think too much about, you know, uh, talent because I'm not there producing a movie. Well, maybe, but, um, maybe writing talent. Yes, yeah, but I will say, uh, let me just mention a few things that I was really proud of. I was uh, one of the people that recommended The Christmas Story. You know that marvelous Christmas movie about the little boy that wants the rifle for Christmas? And um, when I recommended that, I, uh, I prophesied that it would be a classic and it would be on television the next 25 years. And I think they just had their 30th anniversary, wow. maybe even their 31st. Yes. So sometimes there are these movies that I think are just, you know, you feel really good that you had something to do with them. And um, I work on all different kinds of movies. So I would, you know, it's, it's hard to know if I would go with the dramas I've worked on or the um, 
or the comedies that I have worked on. But there's three movies I've worked on, three scripts that are moving forward toward production. Of course, I can't mention them, but I am very excited because those are the kind of things where I can say that would be such a privilege to have been part of the development of that script. So, um, Well, certainly you've been part of some uh, very outstanding and prestigious careers, of which I know the list is exceedingly long after so many decades in the industry. Um, so, Dr. Seg, I know obviously you've written uh, numerous books yourself. In fact, uh, your book, uh, Making a Good Script Great, was one of the first books that I myself ever read on um, screenwriting, and I highly recommend it to our listeners. Um, other than obviously your own books, what would be one book that you would recommend for our, lead, uh, our listeners and why? Okay, I'm going to give you an unusual answer. I'm going to say the Bible. And the reason is all the great themes, all the great stories of which many other stories are based on and are all in that that book. And people, and I would put Shakespeare, I mean, if there were a second yeah. uh, ones, because um, so many great movies in some way resonate with either the themes or the, you know, the stories and the same thing with books. My favorite book is East of Eden, which is really the Cain and Abel story. And you also have in that book that sense not only of relationships and problems, the great conflicts that happen between people and between tribes and nations. I mean, all the epic stuff and all the little personal stuff is in there. And then you do have that sense of the sacred or the other part of life, you know, that there's a spiritual part to our life or a transcendent part of our life. And say that, you know, movies should have values. And so getting in touch with um, the, the great stories that have a value emphasis to them, I think, is really important. What and do you, you think... Don't have to, Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm I'm curious to know what you think of this proliferation of uh, Bible-based stories, kind of rather big budget Bible-based stories that we've seen coming out in Hollywood. Uh, some of them more successful than others, commercially speaking. Um, yeah. What have you? Wh what do you feel? Do you, do you kind of feel like that's the the future? Do you think that Hollywood is is doing a good job of these adaptations, or do you feel that it's somewhat lacking? Well, the first thing is in saying, you know, the Bible is a great piece of literature, is I'm not saying you then adapt all the stories in the Bible. And I think what happens when people do do Bible-based movies, there, there's two mistakes they make. One is that they are not accurate enough. And they say, if you're going to adapt something, you better stick with what is there and only do extras that are implied. That is, don't contradict that because you're going to have a lot of uh, angry audiences um, with that. The other thing is I think a lot of these Bible-based movies are not metaphoric enough. They're not playing their theme. They, they, sometimes they get very preachy about what they're trying to say as opposed to playing the images and playing the conflicts and you know playing the real emotions of it. So... Um, you, it's, it's difficult stuff to adapt. I have worked on some adaptations of biblical material. So, um, but I do think this faith-based idea says there is a huge audience out there of people who are spiritually aware. And although many of the Bible-based or faith-based are specifically Christian, if they really think about their biggest themes they don't have to just have a Christian audience. They can really have more of a mainstream and say this is, you know, I mean, spiritual stuff is kind of truthful at its core, and a lot of people who are spiritual will agree with a lot of the same things. And I'm not talking just about a belief system, but, um, you know, sort of, I guess we could say the spiritual metaphors that we can feel in touch with. I deeply agree with you, I think. In fact, it's interesting. I was just having this conversation with a, actually with a studio today 
um, of, of saying to them, listen, I really believe that the values in a, in a well-executed faith-based movie can largely transcend the immediate audience, for example, that immediate Christian audience, because so many of the themes are at their core very human, ex- you know, about very human experiences, and that's not something that necessarily needs to be restri- restrictive or prescriptive. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Film Talk Nation, I know that you love audio. To thank you for joining us today, we've partnered with our friends over at Audible to offer you a free audio book. Great titles available include Why Not Me by Mindy Kaling and Your Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. If you haven't already done so, you can claim your free audio book at audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. That's audibletrial.com forward slash film talk. And this link will also be included in today's show notes. Um, Dr. Sager, um, I'm sure that you're a massive film buff um if you could recommend one movie uh for our listeners to watch maybe as an example of a really well constructed story what would it be and why well if we talk about well constructed i think the movie shane the old western is fabulous i think witness is another movie uh you can learn so much about structure just from those two films. It's so interesting to me that you mentioned Witness. Um, I was interviewing the director of photography, Bob Scott, recently, who mentioned the same movie, um, which I was delighted by because Witness is, is, you know, one of my favorite movies. So, you know, I feel like when you have uh, two people within a week um, recommending the (laughs) same movie, then that's, it's definitely one that needs to be checked out. Um, Do you find yourself watching a lot of movies to kind of, I mean, I'm sure at this point in your career, you're, you're probably not needing so much to hone your craft, but do you find most of your inspiration in, um, in you know, kind of understanding story structure comes from movies or does it more so come from, you know, books, literature, scripts? It, it, I get it more from movies and I'm always looking for a movie that has something both new to teach and is a great movie to, to teach with mm. and uh, the thing I find is some of the older movies are just more teachable but I, that's why I'm excited about Bridge of Spies this year I think there's a lot of stuff to learn from that movie and I will probably start using it in my teaching Interesting. Well, um, I don't know if this really so much applies to your line of work, Dr. Sega, but is there a website or an app that you would recommend to our listeners? Um, maybe something that is uh, particularly applicable to people who are looking to write their own scripts and looking to develop their own material. Well, I'm on, um, I get a lot of information from something called Stage 32, and a lot of what they have on there seems good. They they talk maybe, you know, do you need an agent? Or they talk about uh, how do you sell your script or whatever. And I, I get things in my email almost every day from them. So that would be an interesting one for people to check out. Are you a, are you a big believer in writers reading other people's scripts and kind of, you know, because I know there's a lot of websites, obviously, um, that enable people to access um, their peers writing or even writing of, you know, movies that have been previously produced. Do you feel that's helpful? Yes. Writers need to read scripts and they need to read the really good scripts and to see how the great writers do it. And they, they can learn they can learn a lot from reading the script, watching the movie, reading the script again. And many writers that I know, as they start a certain project, they will read the best scripts in that genre. So if they're going to write an action adventure, they're probably going to read Raiders of the Lost Ark and read Die Hard, which are considered two of the best. And if they're going to do a thriller, they're going to really look at North by Northwest, which is considered one of the best. And, And to read the script also. Yeah. No, I've I've definitely heard that recommended um, quite thoroughly as, as a good practice for uh, developing minds in screenwriting. Um, Dr. Sega, it's time for the martini shot. What parting piece of guidance would you like to leave us with? One of um, the, a good piece of advice, I think, is to invest in yourself. That if you are starting out or you are trying to get a career in screenwriting, 
or in the film industry. Um, don't be afraid to put up money to take a seminar, to buy a book, to go and you know buy the movies that you need to see again and again, to hire a script consultant, to go on a writing retreat. Um, the, the sense about nobody does it alone in this business. There is no such thing as a self-made person. We all need to have help. We all need to have teamwork. We need to have people helping us. And sometimes you have to pay for that. And so not be afraid to, to pay for that um, and to invest in making yourself better and better at what you do. And um, Dr. Seg, are you, are you teaching seminars that um, kind of anyone can sign up for or are those purely private events? Um, I, I teach in many places and most of them are open to the public. At the moment, the next one I'm teaching at is in Orlando at the end of April. So it's, um, but it's a, it's a Christian writers conference and uh, there, and I think I'm just doing a couple speeches. So, but they can look at, check my website and I keep a list of what it is that I'm going to be doing or where I'm going to be speaking. I had a huge year last year. I was in Europe for nine weeks and just got back from Norway and having taught there for five days. So, wow. um, Well, so. if, if our listeners are interested in connecting with you, and I'm sure many of them will be, what is, what's your website address that they it, can go to? It's just lindasager.com. Lindasager.com. is, yeah, S-E-G-E-R. Okay, lindasager.com. Well, I uh, believe that many people will be beating a path to that website. Um, I know having personally experienced your services that the, uh, the, just the degree of insight is worth every single penny. Um, I know for me, it's probably, uh, you know, hiring you is probably the best film class I ever took. I mean, you know, you, you honestly, you probably taught me more in a few pages of analysis than um, I possibly received in three years of college. So I highly, highly would recommend it. And I believe that, you know, if, if so many um, of our most outstanding names in this industry uh, consider you to be the consultant to go to, then um, certainly we should as well. Um, <laughs> Well, that's a wrap. Film Talk Nation, in this industry, you're only as good as people you know. And today you've been hanging out with Dr. Linda Saker and myself. If you want to go the extra mile, head over to filmtalkpodcast.com and type Linda Sager into everything we discussed, like Dr. Sager's recommended book and movie. Dr. Sager, we appreciate you sharing your priceless insight with us today. Film Talk Nation thanks you, and we'll see you on the red carpet. Yeah.